All right, once again, we are with Mike Day, and this time we're out in the field, and uh, we found some things that I would have completely overlooked, and so uh, Mike is going to explain again how we find bone in this fossiliferous rock. Mike, go ahead, please. So you're interested in this one, um, and this one's a vertebra. So here you can see there's a sort of circular structure. So this is the sort of the main trunk of the vertebra that bears the weight. Um, there's a sort of small hole in the middle because in these vertebrae they have a sort of cone in the middle, two cones on each side that meet. So the vertebra is thickest around the rim and it's thinnest uh, right in the middle. So you're just catching the end of that cone there. The rest of the bone has kind of weathered away. Um, and you'll see this here, this is filled with matrix, so this is rock. Uh, that's the, the canal for the spinal cord. And then above it, you have the neural uh, arch. So you have, I think it's probably better on the other side. So we're just looking at the other side of the vertebra. You'll see here this sort of process and a gap between them. So this is one of the zygopophyses of the vertebra. So this is how one vertebra connects to the other. And in pariasaurs, uh, which are parareptiles like this, rather than having two small zygopophyses which connect directly um, back to front, they kind of stick out to the side like this. So that is quite a big difference between the pariasaurs and the, the dinocephalian thoracids. It helps us identify them based on scrappy material like this. Um, and then you have a few more structures. So just at the top here, you can see the, the, new, uh, the dorsal process, which in pariasaurs has this kind of round shape, whereas in uh, dinocephalians and other therapsids, it's sort of more blade-like back to front. I see. Yeah. And we have, uh, we have two, two more samples, do we? Uh, of other pieces? Yes. Yes, we've got, we've got several chunks of this thing. It's in, quite a lot of it is embedded in matrix. For instance, here we have a piece of a rib. So it's, yeah, it's quite narrow. Help, uh, for, I don't know how, what, how good the camera quality is. Let's draw out that uh, rib bone. So, so you have the edges of it here, comes up, and then it expands out. And there's a sort of little uh, depression in the middle. Um, yeah. Now a rib of that shape that gets so wide at the end, does that indicate what the animal is? Uh, not necessarily. In a, in a lot of these large animals, they have uh, sort of two points of connection between the rib and the vertebra. One on the side of the centrum, down here, and one with the transverse process, so which is one of these processes which comes out. Okay. Is that the piece we were just looking at a moment ago? When yes, you're holding? this is the one, this is one we were just looking at. Okay. But I think that's part of the transverse process there, so that's one point of contact between one of these heads of the rib. So. And I, I picked up fifty rocks that look like this today, <laughs> and well, not not with it, not with the distinct rib in there. I think I would have caught that, but the other one, the other one you were showing up, I would have completely glanced over it. And what was it about this last one? So this last one I haven't really looked at properly yet. Um, this one, ah, it's, it's also a set of vertebrae. So. This one's even harder to see on this surface because it's sort of covered in this, this sort of coating down here. But this is a vertebral centrum, and this is this canal for the spinal column, for the spinal cord, and you've got the neural arch up here. So it's quite badly weathered. Uh, and then there's another piece of bone on the side here, which even now, if I, you... my skills can't identify. Huh. Okay. So, All right, well, we won't bother with that. They know if it was important enough, if that, if the, if the one you were just showing me was important enough, how would we get, would we take it out of the matrix and how would they do that? So we, we wouldn't do it in the field. We would take it back to the lab and then it would... Because we have a CT scanner at the lab first to trace what's in there. Okay. We do. So there are, I mean, there are, there are limits on the size. Um, so a chunk like that could probably just get in the CT scanner, but not much larger than that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the Permian rocks here in the Karoo are filled with metallic inclusions that mean that um, they don't scan very well. The image is kind of washed out uh, uh, with sort of like white colors, right? And then yeah. you have uh, like acid and other devices to... Yeah. 
So the main way we would prepare something like this is mechanically. So we have a little air scribe, little sort of drill-like thing. Sifilani will tell you maybe more about that later. But um, it's a mechanical drill that chips off the matrix bit by bit. So it's quite a long process, and for a large animal like this, it can take a long time. How large is this animal? This animal, um, potentially cow-sized, small cow-sized. Really? Yeah. Okay. They're very, very chunky, so their bones are a lot bigger than a, than a cow's would be. So in the Permian, cow size is pretty close to about as big as it gets. Isn't yeah. It? These would be some of the, pretty much the largest animals on the landscape. All right, Cephalani, you found something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I found what lo looks like the, the proximal bit of an alna of a very large uh, animal, yeah. possibly a uh, pariaso. All right, so again, I'm going to zoom in on this so we can see the spongy texture of the uh -huh, bone there. Uh -huh. And how big is this bone? You said it's an ulna. Yeah, that's the proximal uh, part of an ulna. Okay. Uh -huh. And I can see it very clear here. Yeah. And the rest of this is stone that's... Yeah, it's still okay. in the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So this is the white face of the, of the ulna. Okay. Well, that's why I'm following you. Because <laughs> you find stuff. <laughs> So this piece is actually the elbow of a large um, herbivorous dinocephalian threat. So it, it, it's quite hard to see it, but this is one of the uh, bones of the forelimb. Mm -hmm. So this is probably a radius. It's actually easier to see from this angle. This is where it, this is what would really give it away, is the cross section through the bones here. So in the forearms and in the foreleg. Uh, of these animals. They have two bones just like we do. Um, in this, in the forearm you have the radius and the ulna. So the ulna, ooh, if we move it around here, so they're quite large in these animals and it has the olecranon process over here to which the mass muscles uh, would attach, uh, that would extend the elbow like that. And we also have a bit of the distal humerus. So the humerus is the bone of the upper arm. Uh, but that's quite badly broken, so it's quite difficult to see. But what would give it away, uh, the sort of the shapes, so these sort of circular shapes, um, if you go in close, you can see you have this cancellous bone in the middle of the bone, and then it gets denser towards the exterior. So you start to see a honeycomb structure, and then very, there's very sort of small pitting in the uh, cortical bone around the edge. All right, so you're showing me uh, another bit of bone that might be one, if one or two vertebrae, mostly encased in matrix. Mm -hmm. And you're showing me the spongy bits that are yeah. your bone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. The spongy bits. Yeah. And so that's all surrounded by matrix. And if you were to get the matrix off of that, uh -huh. and you, you're expecting that would be two vertebrae. Yeah, almost, yeah. Two or so vertebrae, yeah. So I had joined this paleontological expedition into the Karoo of South Africa, and I spent four days in the field and hadn't found anything at all, when everyone else had found plenty of things, because they're all PhD students or professors or museum curators, and I just didn't have the practical experience or the trained eye that they do. On the morning of the fifth day, one guy found the skull of a massive temnospondyl, basically a salamander the size of an alligator, seen here upside down. How did he even recognize what that was? I climbed to the highest altitude I could reach and surveyed the surrounding area, and I noticed a mudstone exposure that no one else had yet seen. And these had proved to be the most productive sites in this particular expedition, so I went down to check it out. At this point, I was feeling pretty useless, functionally blind compared to the team of experts I was hanging around with. Until finally, I found something that was definitely fossil bone. In fact, there were bones all over the place. This site turned out to be a boneyard seemingly along the edge of a Permian River where a number of animals were piled together, perhaps after seasonal flash flooding. I collected quite a few bones in this area, femurs, ribs, and vertebrae of a few different animals, including this massive vertebrae of what we think is probably a Titanosuchus, or Titanic crocodile. That's a deceptive name because these are therapsids, basal to what would become mammals and not like crocodiles at all. 
I got on the radio and called the other guys over and they all found stuff very close to where I was. One guy found a part of a femur and kept walking and found the rest of it strewn over a 10 meter distance. Wouldn't it be flatter if it was a rib and not so hollow? True, so yeah, maybe it's more like a long bone. And my best find, I think, was part of a therapsid skull cap that wasn't in a mudstone deposit. It was just in the sand by itself with nothing else like it in sight. So there was no way to find the rest of the skull, I'm sorry to say. Many of these type fossils can only be positively identified if you can find the teeth with it. But at least I found something after all this time. A lot of these fossils are, as you can see here, just bones made of stone all of their own, but the best preserved ones are those that are found surrounded by a protective matrix encased in rock with only a part of the bone showing along the edge. For example, Mike Day, curator of non-mammalian tetrapods at the Natural History Museum in London, just happened to recognize two teeth indicative of the snout of a diectodon, and the rest of the skull is likely encased in the surrounding rock. PhD student Mark Vandenbrandt found a similar fossil. Um, Aaron, so we just found this uh, small dicynodon skull over here, and let me turn it around for you. Okay, so this is looking from underneath. So this is the lower jaw, this V-shaped structure here, it's the bottom of the lower jaw. And then we have two canine teeth sticking out either side there. So those are the canines, the only teeth these animals have. It's probably diectodon which is a very common Karoo fossil that we find, a little plant eater with a tortoise-like beak. And if we turn it over this way, the nostrils would be here, eyes and the jaw muscles in the back of the skull. So unfortunately, it's sheared off sort of straight through the line there. Um, but this is how we find them. This was loose right here on the ground. I think it was over there, like that. So when we walk around, we go for these kind of green-gray outcrops. Uh, that's the mudstone or siltstone. We're literally old mud that buried the skulls. And uh, they erode out of the hills and uh, then look like that. When you find a fossil that is mostly encased in stone like this, there's a very slow and tedious process that can remove the surrounding matrix to expose much better preserved fossils than you could find just lying around on the ground. Like this skull and articulated jawbone they had back at the lab. Look at the exquisite detail preserved here. And these were found together inside a nodule of rock, just like the one that Mark had found. And so was this mandible with perfectly preserved teeth. That makes fossil hunting even harder because some of the best stuff is almost invisible to the untrained eye. I intend to go on another dig like this with hopefully a little bit more competence this time. Sadly, Permian exposure here in Texas is almost entirely marine and is otherwise only early Permian, so... Dimetrodons and Sphenacodons are about the most interesting things I'm likely to find. Not like in Africa, where I had access to middle Permian strata and a much greater potential for transitions. Anyway, if you ever find yourself looking for fossils, I hope that this, uh, this video helped you identify them, and uh, happy hunting. <laughs>